here before you leave the room, please make sure that you all get in touch with you. Okay, um, welcome to our panel today on Japanese Supreme Court, um, which is sponsored by the Federal Society. We have a special guest with us today, Professor Josh Blackman. He is an associate professor of law at South Texas College of Law and specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Professor Blackman was selected by Forbes Magazine for the 30 under 30 in law and policy. And he has testified before the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration. Professor Blackman is the founder and president of the Harvard Institute, the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, which if you guys haven't checked out, it's not like it. You should play. You should definitely play. Uh, he's also the author of two dozen law review articles and blog with Josh Blackman.com. He clerked for Judge Danny Boggs of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And, for, uh, Judge Kim Gibson. and Shelby went to school with Judge Gibson's son, and that's what I've noticed since high school. There we go. That was very important. <laughs> <laughs> He's in his bio. <laughs> um, but he took for uh, Judge Kim Gibson in the Western District of Pennsylvania, and he is a graduate of George Mason University School of Law. We also have with us today Professor Stuart Benjamin. He is the Douglas B. Knight Professor of Law. Associate Dean for Research and Co-Director of the Center for Innovation Policy for Law School. He specializes in telecommunications law, the First Amendment, and administrative law. From 2009 to 2011, he was the first distinguished scholar at the FCC. Professor Benjamin is also the co-author of Telecommunications Law <coughs> Policy, has written numerous law review articles, and has testified before the House and Senate committees as a legal expert on various kinds of topics. Professor Benjamin clerked for Judge William Candy of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the Supreme Court Justice David Souter, who received his bachelor's and JD from Yale University. So, for this event, uh, Professor Blackman will give his remarks. And Thank you. Then um, we'll have uh, Professor Benjamin respond and hopefully have some time for questions. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much to Duke for this warm welcome. Um, the topic today is not on immigration policy. And I'll make that point very clear. Uh, I'm in this somewhat awkward position where I think a policy is good, but the action is unconstitutional. Um, we're talking about the presence of uh, executive action immigration, DAPA and DACA. And today I'd like to discuss whether these policies are consistent with his duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And I'll begin my talk with a history of how these policies came about and move on to the current Supreme Court case, United States versus Texas, which we argued on April 18th, next uh, month for the Supreme Court. So throughout the 1990s into the 2000s, there was always a big debate in Congress on how to handle the question of immigration. And in the first few years of the Obama presidency, an act came around that would have helped this problem. It was known as the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act would have provided a pathway to citizenship for certain aliens who came here as minors without authorization. Okay. Um, as a matter of policy, I support the DREAM Act, but that's neither here nor there for today's topic. The DREAM Act actually managed to pass in the House of Representatives. However, it was killed in the Senate uh, based on a Republican filibuster. So shortly after the DREAM Act was killed in Congress, President Obama announced what became known as DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And the purpose of DACA was not amnesty, and let's be very clear on our terminology. The purpose of DACA was to provide a status known as deferred action to these dreamers, people who came here as minors. What is deferred action? It basically means the government says, we will not deport you. We'll put you at the bottom of the line for removal. But as a consequence of this grant of deferred action, a person now gets work authorization and entitlement to Social Security, an entitlement to Medicaid, and a host of other federal benefits. Um, after DACA was announced, Justice Scalia, uh, who, who uh, we remember him deeply, uh, uh, wrote a dissent in a case called Arizona versus United States. And in that dissent in Arizona, which had nothing to do with DACA, Scalia charged the Obama administration with lawlessness, uh, saying they are suspending the law. So if you want to know how Justice Scalia would have voted, in the Texas case, he already told you in the Arizona case. Fast forward a couple years later, and the Senate considered an immigration bill. This was the proverbial gang of eight bill, which Marco Rubio is trying to uh, take credit for or not, depending who he's talking to. Um, the gang of eight bill would have provided what's known as 
comprehensive immigration reform. It will provide a form of amnesty or citizenship or pathway thereof for up to 11 million uh, aliens who are in the United States. Okay. The Gang of Eight bill, with the help of um, Senator Rubio, passed in the United States Senate. However, it never came up for a vote in the House of Representatives. The reason why is because of Eric Cantor. A few days before the House vote on the immigration bill, David Bratt, a professor from Virginia, defeated the House Majority Leader in Virginia. Defeated him. John Boehner freaked out and said, okay, we cannot bring this immigration bill up for a vote right before our, our elections in the midterms, right? So the immigration bill stalled in the House. Shortly after, that same day, President Obama gave an address in the Rose Garden. And President Obama explained that where Congress does not take action, I will. And he said, I will use executive action to the extent to which I have the authority to do so to change or to, to reform immigration policy. Over the course of the summer of 2014, President Obama made a number of statements of what he would do, what he would not do. But he took no actual action until after the November elections. And in November 2014, after the midterm elections, President Obama announced a policy that became known as DAPA. Now that's D-A-P-A, -A, Deferred Action for the Parents of Americans and Lawful Residents. The LR just goes nowhere. So it just, it's not Doppler, you know, Doppler radar, it's just DAPA. Now what was DAPA? DAPA was not an executive order, as it's often dubbed. It was a series of executive memoranda from the Department of Homeland Security. What did it accomplish? So the first aspect was one of prioritization. It said, as a matter of course, we will not prioritize certain types of aliens. We will prioritize people with felonies, we will prioritize criminals, people who are bad.
challenge under the take care clause. So I'll give you a brief history of how the case went. Um, the case was filed in the Southern District of Texas in Brownsville. Um, I, I was an amicus of the district court on behalf of the Cato Institute, so I'm in the tank on this one, uh, but I, I will describe it as passionately as I can. Um, the federal district court in Brownsville ruled that DAPA needed to go through notice and comment. The federal court did not, not reach the constitutional question. It was appealed to the Fifth Circuit, um, indeed argued by Duke alum, Scott Keller. Yeah, no, no, alum. we won't burn any students, a uh, Texas alum, Scott Keller. Um, at that point, the Fifth Circuit ruled in favor of Texas, finding that not only did that go through notice and comment, also it was substantively unreasonable. The Fifth Circuit did not reach the constitutional question. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court by the United States government. A few months ago, the court granted certiorari. And to the surprise of many, the court added an additional question presented. The court asked the parties to brief whether the president's duty to faithfully execute the law was violated. By my count, this was the first instance in 200 years where the court has ever asked the president to justify that he has faithfully executed the law. So this was a big deal. However, the case was largely affected by the passing of Justice Scalia, um, as we don't quite know now what will happen. Or ask be briefed on this. So in my time today, I'd like to discuss the take care clause and how it affects immigration. And at the outset, I'd like to reject uh, what's often a straw man. Um, I am not arguing the president has no discretion. Indeed, he has to have discretion. Congress has only appropriated enough money to deport roughly 400,000 people a year. There are about 11 million people in the United States subject to removal. So it's simply not the case that the president um, uh, uh, has to enforce every tidbit of the law. But I do think that the take care clause imposes a duty on the president of good faith. And that concept of good faith is a familiar one, which we've read in contracts and otherwise. In effect, the president must try to comply with the terms of the charter he's under. We have an immigration uh, uh, statute, and the president should try to enforce it with the purpose in mind of actually trying to do what Congress wanted. However, when the president steps aside that and tries to subvert the law, we have a problem. Now, the reason why I began my talk this morning with the history of DACA and DAPA was to suggest the background. The president sought Congress to pass a statute that would have given him the authority to not deport the dreamers, and Congress rejected that statute. The president sought the authority from Congress to grant a legal status to millions of people here illegally, and Congress rejected that request. I think that history is very relevant and salient to the take care injury because in terms of Youngstown, our canonical case, the president's acting at his lowest ebb. He asked for authority, Congress said no. He then attempted to do something not the exact same, but something quite similar to it unilaterally. And when you're in the lowest ebb of Youngstown, the courts apply scrutiny. They analyze the situation very closely. Any a close analysis will reveal that this action is indeed unlawful. So the way to describe deferred action often is by saying, okay, what have past presidents done? Right? To understand if executive action is constitutional, we look, what has been done in the past? And this action of this, this idea of deferred action has been used very often. Um, presidents going back to Eisenhower have at least used this in various contexts. And it's usually used in one of two contexts. The first context in which it is used concerns foreign policy. So I'll give you an easy example. What if you were a Chinese student in the United States um, during the Tiananmen Square massacre, okay? Your student visa ended. The United States would have a pretty good interest in not sending you home during this serious unrest in China. And indeed, the president at the time used deferred action to grant this temporary status to those who would have been uh, uh, perhaps persecuted. Now, there's an asylum process for sure, but that's a fairly rigorous and time-consuming process. Deferred action was used in this manner for foreign affairs purposes. The second major way that deferred action has been used concerns what I call a bridge. And I'll give you a very easy example. Imagine you were a foreign student at Tulane University in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, right? You were a foreign student, you had your visa, everything was great. But then because of Hurricane Katrina, 
the school shut down. And because the school shuts down, you lose your credit hours. And when you lose your credit hours, you lose your visa. That means you have to go home. The second you lose your credit hours, you're subject to removal. That doesn't make much sense. So what President Bush said in 2005 was, if you can enroll at another university by next semester, we will let you have deferred action. This deferred action was then used as a transition, a way to get someone from point A to point B, where on the other end of the status, something was waiting for them. But once they enrolled at that other university, they would get their credit hours up, and they would then be able to stay in the United States under their student visa. It made no sense to deport them during this brief interregnum when the school was closed. If past practice is any example, what President Obama did is not a good analogy. Why? At the end of the three-year DAPA period, absolutely nothing is waiting for these beneficiaries. At the end of the three-year grant of DAPA, they will be in the exact same position they were when they started. There is no legislative relief on the other end. There is no status waiting for them. All that happens is perhaps they get it renewed for another three years. So in this sense, DAPA is not serving as a bridge from one status to another, but as a tunnel under and through the immigration laws of Congress. And for this reason, I think it's hard to say the president is faithfully executing the law when, in fact, he's trying to work around it. Now, there have been other examples in American history where presidents have used deferred action. Uh, for example, President Reagan used in the 1980s. And this was used as a way to bridge people who were able to apply for adjustment of status in a couple years, temporary. Uh, president George H.W. Bush used a similar method. I'm not convinced his was legal either. Uh, the extent was there was a brief six-month period before the Senate and House agreed on a bill, and it was used to just get people over until a law was passed and they could adjust their status. What we have here is not a way to work with Congress, a way to work around Congress. I think, and I can say this with some confidence, the president sincerely hoped and believed that he could grant people deferred action 2014 through 15, and then the next president will be stuck with all the people saying, wow, we have all these people, let's give them status to legislation. Right? This was a method of pushing legislative process. What the president did not anticipate, indeed I think he was totally, totally surprised by, was that Texas's lawsuit was as successful as it was. And they basically put the entire issue on ice. So I want to turn now briefly to what I think will happen at the Supreme Court next month. Um, if you had asked me a month ago, I would give you a very different answer. Um, but I'm not convinced now that there are necessarily five votes to rule for Texas on the merits. Um, there might be, uh, uh, but I'm not you know, too optimistic, as, as we shall say. Um, the first threshold issue that Professor Young has written on is the issue of standing. Um, and there's a distinct possibility that Texas will lose by the court simply saying there's no standing. Um, every year, Chief Justice Robert breaks my heart. I told the guys at last night, every year, Chief Justice Robert breaks my heart. If he breaks my heart this year, it will be on standing grounds, and the court will five to three there's no standing, and this case goes away. Um, the other possibility is the case puts four to four. And I humbly submit that this is not that bad of a deal. The reason why is that the outcome of the next election will decide the fate of this case. So let's say the court splits 4-4 and a Republican wins the White House, uh, whether it's Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. On day number one, DAPA will be rescinded. This case gets, goes away, it's moot. Okay, let's say a Democratic president wins and this case goes 4-4. That only resolves the temporary. This is an appeal from a preliminary injunction. This case hasn't even gone to trial yet. There's no summary judgment. This case will come back up to the court, right? And indeed, President or, or, or candidate Clinton has said you would expand DAPA even further. So maybe an amended complaint to be had. So uh, a 4 4 would not be the end of the world. Um, in fact, I may even suggest in my uh, amicus brief the case should be digged, uh, dismissed as improvidently granted. Um, the reason why is because this is an appeal from a preliminary injunction, there's no hearing. It's a bad vehicle. The facts aren't very good in this case. Um, but assuming that the court actually rules five for three in favor of the federal government, um, it's logistically impossible for President Obama to implement this in the waning days. And let me explain this. Um, if you're an immigrant and, and you're considering applying for this, and you see that Donald Trump wins the next election, um, you may be somewhat leery of giving your biometric information to the federal government. I don't say this lightly. It's going to be very difficult for people to sign up for this if you know, the next president is someone who will use this information for other purposes. So no matter what happens, it will be up to the next presidency to decide this, which I think is all the better reason why if the court wants to sit and wait on this, um, uh, they ought to. 
Uh, but in terms of the constitutional question, I think the best case scenario is maybe a concurring opinion or dissenting, as it were, by Justice Thomas or maybe Justice Alito um, to flesh out what does it mean for the president to faithfully execute the law? Um, I'll close with this. This is something that I think liberals have far more to fear than conservatives. Okay? Generally speaking, conservatives don't like enforcing laws. They like lax enforcement of immigration laws, environmental laws, corporate security laws. Conservatives don't like rigorous enforcement laws. This suspension power which President Obama has employed is much more conducive to Republican administration. Just imagine how President Trump or whoever pick, pick your figure, right, would handle a decision not to enforce a corporate income tax or not to enforce the Clean Water Act or not to enforce the Clean Air Act. It's very attractive. Liberals, who usually like over enforcing the law and rigorous enforcement of regulation, have the most to lose from this. So I think that adds an additional valence to this case that hasn't been known. Um, the liberals in the court may be somewhat leery of giving Donald Trump a blank check to not enforce various aspects of the law. Um, it, it is, this is not you know, hypothetical. This is a real factor to be considered, which is all the more reason not to have a decision on the merits in any respect until we know what's happening with the next election and indeed until we know what's happening with the next seat on the Supreme Court. Um, I thank you very much for your attention. I'll welcome your questions and turn it over to Professor Benjamin for a few uh, for some remarks. Thank you so much. So, um, so much to say. Um, so a few different issues that are going on in this in this uh, in this case, they've been they've been um, hit on well. I'm also not going to talk about standing, but I do want to highlight on the merits. Um, one argument that Josh didn't mention is um, in a case called Heckler versus Cheney, which those of you taking administrative law with me will get to soon enough. Um, the government gets to have priorities, and it gets to put some things on the bottom of, of its priorities, and, sim and simply never get to those things. So, um, any given agency gets to have Priorities one to hundred, and never get past, past priority five, um, and that's that's well recognized. The argument, in, in, so that's one argument in addition to the to, to the ones that that Josh mentioned. Um, second, that that Josh did talk about is maybe this is the argument is is this uh, uh, substantively inconsistent with the, the statute? I'll come back to that, um, and and then in, um, and then there's also the take care argument, which I find unpersuasive for reasons I'll, I'll talk about. Um, in addition to, to um, all of those, um, there is also um, an argument um, that's, uh, that, you should, that, that you should be aware of that these are just guidance documents and that they don't actually have to go through a no, notice and comment. Again, only administrative law uh, junkies will, will care about this, but I, you, should, you should just know that argument is, is out there. Um, I want to talk just for a minute about why I'm unpersuaded that Josh is right in his arguments about this being um, substantively permissible, and therefore why I'm really unpersuaded that there's any take any take care problem. So, so what's actually happened? So, um, imagine that a president says, um, under this immigration statute that gives me enormous authority, um, I am going to defer action on a set of people, not which means they will. Um, effectively know that they aren't going to be kicked out of the country. They actually are not being given amnesty. They aren't being given any, any, any exalted legal status. But by deferring action on them, their status is actually changing. And I'm doing that, understanding that it's not clear what Congress is going to do. Um, so that is what George Herbert Walker Bush did in 1990 in the family, in the family unifications um, proceedings, uh, um, deferred action that, uh, that he had. And um, I'm not at all persuaded that there was anything unlawful um, about that. It seems to me a fair, that this is the authority that Congress has given presidents under the, under the Immigration Act. Um, so right off the bat, we just have this question, is this just like a Heckler versus Cheney, a failure to prosecute? Um, you know, this is not something that we are that we that we're making an agenda item, uh, and then going into the merits. And isn't this like what has happened? Not only all the time on the Immigration Act, but there's good reason to think that actually that's what Congress wanted. Congress wanted to give presidents lots of authority to make their own determinations as to who are to be the priorities um, and who are not going to be the priorities. Um, so then we get to to, to Josh's point, um, which is, but wait a minute, but isn't this flying in the face of 
congressional inaction. So isn't this the lowest ebb under Youngstown? Um, and the answer is no, because as Josh notes, this isn't amnesty. You actually don't get um, the things that the, the statute would have given you. So the, you would have gotten a lot under the, uh, un, under the statute. All you get here is you get put to the back, you get, you get put to the back of the line. You're, you're told you'll be, the, um, you'll be sort of the last to go. And then you might say, but wait, what is this? What about, but doesn't, don't other benefits attach to that? Yes, other benefits do attach to that pursuant to regulations that were promulgated under Ronald Reagan. Um, so that's right. When you get deferred action, then there are, there are certain other consequences that flow from that, and they have for 30 years. So, and, and in addition to, to all of that, um, these, are, these actually are written as guidance documents. They're, they're not written as, as telling, any, telling anything. And so the district, so court, district court decided to credit decided those things. Credit so, those things. So, um, one... Um, um, person in the immigration uh, office and not the office itself. Um, but the problem is there's a reason, there's a re totally reasonable argument that this is actually just guidance. This actually is not um, cabining the discretion of the agency, which as you'll see is sort of a, a key litmus test for how we understand what, what guidance documents are to get into the weeds just a little bit. There's a fifth circuit case known as P2C2 patients and professor, oh, no, anyway, that has a slightly, different, a slightly different take on what guidance documents are than the Supreme Court in a case called Lincoln versus Vahil. But in the Supreme Court, of course, Lincoln versus Vahil is going to be controlling, not the, not the Fifth Circuit case. So for all of these reasons, um, I, I'm unpersuaded that, that there's anything um, at all, um, frankly, either different or legally troubling by um uh by what's happening yeah i mean, I mean sure trouble at the end of the day i'm not at all persuaded there's anything un unlawful here so now let me get to the key point so um you know with res respect i think this is a terrible case for uh the take care clause i'm happy they i'm happy they they added it to the questions presented sure why not um but i just want you to think about if you're really going to take seriously, if we're going to constitutionalize this. So everything else we've been talking about, these are just statutory arguments, right? This is just, what did Congress, how do we understand the statute? By the way, the more that we're going to say, it, it, we think it disagrees not with the text of the statute, but with the purpose of the statute. we got a problem for textualists, but hold that aside. So what, what do we think is the, the text of the statute says? How do we think the, the statute gets implemented by the agency? Do we think the agency implementation is consistent with Congress's will? That's all just statutory questions, right? That's all just ordinary garden variety administrative law. Going to the take care clause, okay, now we're, now we're, now we're, now we're going nuclear, right? Now we're bringing the big guns. Now we're going to say there's a constitutional problem here. Um, wow. So just to be clear, the court has never, ever held that anything the president has done has violated the, the take care One case. Clause. You are still to Kendall. Kendall. Oh, okay. all right. Yes, in a tight, and let's be honest, in a tiny, tiny context. I mean, they didn't go after Andrew Jackson, right? We're talking about, and all the things that never mattered, never a take care problem. Um, and now we're going to try to render justiciable. We're trying to try to give meaning to what the, the take care clause, which, by the way, so I should, cards on the table, I should tell you that I am an alumnus of the Office of Legal Counsel the, that issued uh, the opinion to which Josh is. Uh, is is responding, um, and the Office of Legal Counsel, the constitutional advisor to the president. So you know we we love the take care clause, they do. and we saw it only going in one direction. It was only empowering the president, and it was making sure the president had full authority over the entirety of the uh, um, of the executive branch, and that's always how it's been um, interpreted. Now we can interpret it differently to impose some affirmative obligations. I mean, that could be fun, right? What about the Republican guarantee clause for state governments? So we can, uh, now, now we can start saying to states, yeah, you know, we think you're screwing up your governance. And so you're actually violating the Republican guarantee clause. So let's have some fun with that. I mean, I, there are a lot of provisions, right? Um, uh, Congress, you know, you're, you're granted all legislative power. We think that the way you're granted, you, you actually aren't doing anything right now. So you're kind of, you're failing in your obligations uh, to exercise legislative power because you, you, all you're doing these, these days is like legislating about post offices. Um, boy, 
why in the world do we, would we think that's the, the right way to go as a matter of constitutional interpretation? That I can conceive of a situation where we really do think president, legislature, you know, Republican guarantee, where something has happened that is so completely outrageous that we think, all right, this actually violates our, our constitutional norms. And that's why I begin with the statutory stuff to say, I just don't think this is that case. I can, I can conceive of it. Um, maybe Andrew Jackson's behavior with respect to Native Americans was that. I don't know. Um, you know, it might, it, maybe there's something on that level where we really feel like what the president is, has done is so utterly lawless that we're now going to finally find some restrictive meaning in, um, in the take care clause. Um, this strikes me as um, a lousy vehicle um, for, uh, for that purpose. And talk about something, you know, you're talking about how liberals and conservatives might, um, might respond. By the way, I, I agree. Historically, the, the executive hawk position, the position of the executive, the unitary executive has been associated with the, the conservative side of the, of the political spectrum. But talk about opening a Pandora's box. If we decide to say we're going to now give meaning to the take care clause. Um, wow. So for those of you who love, um, who don't much like um, uh, democratic institutions, you should love that. Um, because this is just an opening now for nine unelected judges to just go wild and start telling the president, this is what you need to do. This is, the, the, this is how far you can go. This is what you, you, where, where, you, where you can't go in order to take care that the, this is not any specific substantive limit on you. This is now our understanding of what is within the bounds of how you um, uh, do your job outside of statutory um, uh, uh, constraints, beyond statutory constraints. Um, that's just not my vision of, of, of governance. I mean, you, you could have a court taking on that role. It is not a role I would, uh, I would wish, for the, wish for the court to take. So of all of the various arguments, the, one that, the only one that I find um, somewhere be between, you know, sort of the intersection of kind of goofy and disturbing, I think, is the, is, is the, is the, the take care clause. I just don't understand why this, would be, why, why this would be a good vehicle for it and why we shouldn't be very fearful of, ju of judges opening the, up that level of power for themselves. But since we're running, I should, I should desist so that people can... Should we, should we call on people? I mean, uh, oh, I'm happy to, I mean, I'll, I'll be. So I'm neither Goofy nor Daffy Duck or whatever, whatever the uh, argument goes. Um, I'm not as troubled as Professor Benjamin is, although perhaps maybe I should be. Um, the short answer is that the president has his duty in the Constitution. And this is the fulcrum that holds the Constitution together. Congress can check virtually every action a president takes Congress cannot check an action the president doesn't take short of impeachment. And let me explain what I mean by that. The president can't fight a war unless there's money for it. The president can't, you know, invade a state unless there's money for it. However, when the president takes actions that are not subject to the power of the purse, it's some of a gray zone. And one interesting aspect of the president's actions here is that it cannot be defunded. The DAPA program is actually paid for by user fees. People actually pay fees to apply for it. So it basically exists entirely outside the discretionary process. Um, even if the court does not take the take care clause seriously, I think there should be a serious conversation about Congress asserting itself more strongly and ensuring that the president cannot slack off and cannot simply choose not to enforce laws he doesn't like. Now, the broader point though, I don't think this is a Heckler v. Cheney problem. I think under Heckley, the government can prioritize however they want. That's why I said there were two memos. There's one on prioritization, and there's one about actually granting the status. Um, Professor Benjamin is exactly right. There is regulations going back to the Reagan Justice Department, giving the Attorney General, and now DHS, the authority to grant work authorization to anyone who's given the status. The problem there becomes this. It's not one of, you know, Chevron. It's one of non-delegation doctrine. If Congress had casually given the Attorney General the power to grant work authorization to five million aliens, then much of the last two decades of immigration would have been moot because the President could just given it to whomever he wanted. I don't think that's even a plausible construction of this 1980 whatever notice and comment rulemaking. And in fact, that's a case, to quote the Supreme Court, there's an elephant in a mouse hole. That is not what Congress had intended. 
Um, so I'm not challenging the prioritization. I'm not saying the president has to remove anyone. My argument is that the manner in which this law has been used to grant the work authorization, other panoply of benefits, is not consistent with the statutory scheme. So I don't know what you're just, I, a lot of things are just going to put But your opening point about Congress not being able to do anything when the president fails to act is absolutely right, and that's absolutely Heckler versus Cheney. So this is, this is, a, this is a serious issue that I don't want you to, to, to lose sight of is absent situations where the president is compelled to do something or agency is compelled to do something, under Heckley versus Cheney, you can always just take more time. Not a priority for today, maybe we'll get to it, maybe we won't. And we let the president have that authority. Now maybe we, um, maybe, I happen to think that's a great idea uh, on, as a policy matter, is also squarely under Heckler versus Cheney, I just want you to think about the opposite of that. So Congress says, gee, we're worried about all the things you don't do, so now there's going to be a lot of lawsuits that are generated about all the various, well, guess what? There's basically an infinite number of things the president doesn't do. Um, and so now we're going to have a huge number of lawsuits about all the, the, the various actions that the president doesn't take. But Ernie, now dying. First to question, you. Professor Young in the front. Thank you, sir. Sir, do you think there's any limit on the president's ability to not enforce the law? So if the President Trump decides he doesn't like the Voting Rights Act, he can just quit enforcing it? Or It'll be huge. So I would, I would, it doesn't like, or because you did say unless there's an obligation to enforce, right? I, I thought the take care argument was that there's always an obligation to enforce law. Are you saying the Congress, it would make a difference if Congress put in a section that says, and we really mean you have to enforce this? So let me first, I, I actually, there's a great answer to this. It was a memo issued by the Office of Legal Counsel uh, in 1994 when I was there, entitled, I think, Presidential Non-Enforcement non of Statutes. I think that's how that we title it. And by the way, we found examples of every president who would refuse to enforce statutes going back to the... Was that because they were unconstitutional? So diff for different reasons, that there, there was there was not enforced. But now he's good. I know the memo. Yeah. Um, I know it well. Yeah, um, so do I. So, um, but now, so, now let me, so now let me go to your... Well, let me go to your question. Look, I think it's a totally fair question, and I think they're going and, and I think that it's um, I think they're going to be first things first. There are going to be statutes that actually do really compel you, and what, what would be the difference? But wait, let me, well, so I, I think that it's totally fair for Congress to say, President, you shall issue regulations after September 11, 2001. You shall issue regulations on air travel. Within some of the regulations were required to be issued within 14 days, right? By the way, no notice and comment rulemaking there, um, and I think that's totally fine for for Congress to do that. And Congress, to, and so there's lots of cases that say when Congress tells you you got to do something, um, then you've got to do it. Again, sort of, I don't think there's any constitutional issue. I just think it's a straightforward statutory um, interpretation question. You're just saying we shouldn't read that into every statute. Correct. Okay. Any non-professors with questions? <laughs> Yes, in the back. In terms of government action versus inaction, how do you distinguish between the two memos that were before the FDA? I just don't see how you can say that they look they diametrically different. On the one hand, the privatization memo, which Texas didn't uh, didn't uh, attack in its, in, its, in its lawsuit, versus the one that affirmatively granted this status. I just don't understand how you can say that both are government action. When they, when theoretically, theoretically if the government simply just wanted to handle its limited resources to go after the most um, dangerous of these illegal aliens. They could just use that part of the So do you know why the government in court argue that they need to grant the work authorization? Do you know the reason? They actually mentioned this once in a brief. I'm sure they'll disavow this as quickly as they can, but I remember. Uh, they wrote that they needed the work authorization as an incentive for people to sign up for DAPA. In other words, that the work authorization was really no big deal. It was just like a carrot to incentivize people to sign up for this program. Um, that is the action I think is inconsistent with the statute. Um, they're not giving this work authorization as a way to get people to sign up. They're giving this work authorization, to use the words of the president, to bring people out of the shadows. Right? This is a way to bring people out of the shadows. Which again, I think it's a laudatory goal as a matter of policy. As a matter of policy, I'm down. But this is not consistent with the faithful execution of the statute. Um, and in terms of the the the, the Reagan era notice and comment, there's no way that I think the statute could be used to give such an awesome power. According to the AG, he can give work authorization to whomever he wants. 
It doesn't have to be a person who is of good character under the government's arguments. That cannot be a plausible reading of the statute, Professor Young's question. I think there is some limit on how far a statute can go and how inconsistent the statute is where it raises a constitutional question. Other questions? Ms. Shelby. Uh, this is for Professor Benjamin. Um, so I wonder what your response is to Josh's point about um, like this not really going anywhere like for the next four or five months and like how people should, how the court should respond thinking about like the election and like should the court think about that? Right, so that I do have a, a reasonably strong feeling. I reasonably strongly feel the court would be in derogation of its duty if it took, if it took any of those other things into account. Maybe it will, right? Um, I think that um, the justices are m more political than we would like them to be. But the more political they are, then the less reason we should have them. Right? It, is that just being that they're just a that, that, that they're just sort of a super legislature that's just um, you know embodying the dead hand of the past because the nature of, of lifetime tenure, and they're taking these political decisions into in, in, into account? Then I really want then I really want to abolish or at least defenestrate them. Defang the court, Benjamin 2016, right? <laughs> so I think, I think to, to Shelby's question, um, the court, due to the nature of the circumstances, will need to think about what happens over the next six months. And they'll need to do this in one very important respect. Let's say they hold over a case for argument for next year. And let's say we don't have a justice confirmed right away. The tell will be when do they schedule the case for argument. They may just hold cases and not schedule them until they have a full court. Indeed, when Justice Alito came onto the court, there were a number of five four decisions where Justice O'Connor was a tie-breaking vote. That all those cases we argued just for Justice Alito to catch the tie-breaking vote. So I mean, there is precedent. Um, it's not so much as thinking of derogation or duty of how the election impacts the court. Um, I think the court has an interest in having major constitutional decisions rendered with a full bench. And to the extent that they know there's going to be a full bench coming up, that may play into it, right? Now, the optics in the background if they don't decide this case now, it may go away. Um, and courts like when cases go away. Um, so simply by having the case being re-argued or held over a dig, the court, the case may disappear and go off the dock altogether. Yes, sir? If there was something at the end of DAPA such that it could be characterized as a bridge, would that make this within the executive's power? So I know that OLC has argued that the parents of US citizens yes do you actually have a way of becoming, they do have an existing path to citizenship through like a, a immediate family visa. Um, so so, so, the, so he asks a very good question, is one I, I get to every talk. So the, the short answer is, if you are, okay, so if you're, if you're born in the United States, if you're born in the US, by virtue of the 14th Amendment, you are a US citizen. Under the 1965 Immigration Act, you cannot petition for an adjustment of status to your parent until you turn 21. It was actually this fascinating colloquy between Senator Robert Kennedy, uh, uh, oh God, was the other one? He was involved with Wolf, uh, or, uh, Irvin, uh, Senator Irvin and Senator Kennedy, where they basically say, we can't have this people come to the United States, give birth, and their kids, you know, adjust their staffs right away. So they put a 21-year gap. So in theory, at least, right, if a child comes to the United States, becomes a citizen, a parent gets DAPA through that child, they would have to wait up to 21 years. In effect, DAPA would have to be renewed eight times, right, before we get there. I think it's a very tenuous argument that, that is, in fact, a bridge because Congress deliberately imposes disability. Another aspect of this is something called a right of entry uh, in property. Uh, it's something called you have to re-enter the country. You have to basically leave the country and adjust at your consul in your home country. So there are all these steps which Congress put before the parent of assistant can adjust status, right? I think that's inconsistent with the bridge metaphor. It takes it far, uh, way too far. Thank you. Other questions? It can't be that we've lulled, lulled you all to sleep. That boring? Wow. Do, do, I, do I win? What? Ace? Yeah. Um, this is sort of more interesting. Uh, could Congress just amend the INA and say, we, Congress, disapprove of DAPA? They did. So the, ha oh, the House of Representatives passed a formal disapproval statement of DAPA. It was a resolution. But, but like a law. Like, like well, the president would veto it. So that'd be a resolution, right? But assuming they could pass it over. So the House of Representatives actually passed resolutions suggesting that this is not consistent with the president's duty. So when I say when you're in Youngstown Zone 3, I think that's actually probative evidence. And if you actually read Youngstown and Danes and Morby Regan, the court looked to what happened after the action. So if you recall in Youngstown, 
uh, after Truman uh, seized the steel mills, Congress took no action. In Dames and Morby Regan, after President announced the Iranian settlement process, Congress took no action. In fact, one member praised it, just as Rehnquist noted that. So I think post hoc action, action after the fact, does inform the Youngstown inquiry. But wait a minute. But there was no later, but there was no legislation passed. I mean, to to Asia's point, Congress can end this tomorrow. Congress can end almost everything the president does tomorrow by saying, no funds they don't shall have be spent. To. Congress doesn't have to pass another statute because they passed one initially. Congress already passed a statute that says you can't do this. Why have to pass another statute? Wait a minute. I'm only getting to your, the point you just made, though, okay. about, about the post hoc action. There is an easy post hoc action here with bicameralism and presentment. No funds shall be spent. They can't That's defund it. this because it's paid for by user fees. That's the Look, point. You can all, no, no funds shall be spent on implementing any aspect of this. But Congress already passed that statute in 1965, 1980. They don't need to pass it again. Well, right. All, all they, that's the entire point. They, they already they passed it. Well, I say they did. <laughs> what, what I'm saying they is, already, that, that's the issue. Um, from Congress's perspective, they don't need to pass under statute because they already did. There's okay. no need. And notice it. Right. That's, that's the existing argument. All I'm noting is Congress always has the ability to do something about this. Because Congress is never unable to, to do something about it. Right. Yeah. They could, right. but they don't they have to always this. But they shouldn't have to pass a statute they already passed. That's the problem with separation right. of powers. And you with bring respect, Congress through all these other hoops, but they shouldn't have to. Yeah, with respect, that's not that's not the way the statute has been interpreted for 30 years. So the way you're interpreting it is not the way it's no, been interpreted. No, Congress has never interpreted the statute in this fashion. I'm President Congress Obama's but, interpretation is unprecedented. To borrow the top of my first book, it's never been interpreted this fashion. That for 30 years, the president had the power to grant work authorization. Where has this power been? In floating in the ether? I mean, this is this is quite novel. <laughs> Except for George Herbert Walker Bush. What Herbert Walker Bush did was for a six month period grant a very small number of people the action. And then, frankly, in the court, I don't think Bush's action was lawful either. And most people didn't even notice at the time, which I think is unfortunate. It was a very short term program. And I think also HW uh, probably ran afoul of the Constitution. Right. So, again, so not unprecedented. So, just to be clear, no, not, no, no, no. not this is with the size and scale. This is, this is uncertainly oh, unprecedented. Question. Degree, right. But yes. I'm, talking, I'm just talking about in terms degree of degree and kind. <laughs> no, not kind. It's, yes. it, it is like what George. But with HW, there's a statue on the horizon. The on the horizon. Pass. It was already <laughs> being in committee. Here, Obama said, You right. won't pass my statue, so I'm going to do it myself. Okay. There's a different so, nature. Right. So HW uh, says, I think, I think this is going to happen. I hope this happens. So I'm going to take this action now in anticipation that I hope this happens. That's Riyadh. Yes, sir. Do you think it should make any Yes. Right, because I mean, we have, on one hand, he says, I've passed a new law. Right? Yeah. I've, I've issued a I've taken law. actions to change the law. I've changed the law. Yes. But in court, the president's lawyers say, we have actually changed nothing. We've given no new status. He's, you know, the, the implication is you shouldn't come out of the shadows because we've given you absolutely nothing that you can rely on. Do you, do you think that should make any difference, yes. or is it just completely yes. up to No, and mind? indeed, Justice Frankfurter's concurring opinion in Youngstown makes a specific point about how the present statements are very relevant. And the reason why they're relevant here is because it sends a signal. If the president had just said internally, we're going to prioritize family of felons over families, and no one knew about this, people would still conform their action. They would still self-deport. They would still take action consistent with the law having a negative incentive. But once the president announces this, People will, will indeed come out of the shadows. They will work. They will they will exist in a manner contrary to what Congress wants. The deterrent of deportation disappears. Well, that's a good alliteration. The deterrent of deportation disappears once this becomes publicly stated, no matter how the government persuades the in court. And you feel the same way then about all sorts of other statements. So you, you're equally interested in having all straight legislative history comments as well by, say, like the floor manager or something like that. Same thing. I was talking about the president's statements, not the member of the floor manager. Well, why not? The floor, the floor manager is the person who's running the bill. So the same thing. Floor manager says, this legislation is finally going to do X. So we should take that into account in interpreting the statute. Well, I'm not a straight up Scaliaite. So I think, I think legislative history does have some, some role to play. I mean, the reason I, I, I ask is, let me just. The answer to that is the same reason why you think that these failures to act should matter. The only way Congress can act is by passing a statute. By cameras, right? That's clear. The president can act unilaterally, and he can take right? statements. So statements are by the authoritative, by the decider, right? Yeah, but the, but we look at the actual statement then, right? So there's a there is a document. There are guidance documents. Change the law. Um, no, but the point is, we look at the. But that's not what the, that's not what the actual. There are legal documents here, right? But it's not any less legal document. The president's statements are just as binding as the president's memos. They're just a statement. No, they're not. Yes, they're why not? Law. They're transcribed statements. They're official <laughs> statements by the president. He's the commander-in-chief. Right, wait, wait, wait. 
So, I just want to so you're saying now that the president's statements are a source of law. Their source of interpretation is faithful the duty. Nothing the president does is a source of law. The president's <laughs> statements are probative of his intent. More a source of law than me, huh? I, mean, I'm, I just think there's something remarkable. It's one thing to say, we've got this piece of paper that an agency has issued, right? And so it's titled a rulemaking, or it's a guidance document, and we can understand that as a source of law. If now we're going to say the president's statements yes. are, are, are a source of law, Honestly, in a Trump presidency, that's going to be a target-rich environment, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Tweets. Well, I love tweets, right? Right, right, exactly. 140 exactly. character. Uh, right, like now, Rosie O'Donnell has officially been, like, banished from the island because Donald Trump apparently said it. It's a source of law. I, I just... So I have a chapter in my next book. Lies lunacy. I have a chapter in my next book called Regulation by Blog Posts. There have actually provisions of the Affordable Care Act that have been delayed by blog posts. I'm not exaggerating. The employer mandate of the ACA was postponed a year by a blog post. I say they adjusted, you know, they updated the ACA status, so to speak. Um, <laughs> you know, it was a, it was a regulatory action by blog post. This does happen. Wait, wait, wait. However, you do it. There are a lot. I have no idea the, the blog post. If the it, blog post, I understand. No, it, 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 the same thing. Wait, wait. Preempted state of state laws through a like posting on, you know, some website of the treasury. Fine. If if and if that is the, the if we're now talking about we're now, now we're not we're just we're talking about rules of recognition how we're getting deep into HLA heart how, what is it that we recognize as law so for better or for worse we recognize these pieces of paper that go into the federal register as law and we look them and we mine them and if we're now going to say every comment of the president is a source of law we have just crossed a huge rubicon cross that rubicon if you said congress doesn't make but in any event, the, the argument is, if it's ambiguous whether this is meant to be a change or not, then why is it relevant if the president characterized it as a change? And if you think, which I think has to be your view, that the main safeguards against this sort of executive overreach are political, then surely we would want to enhance those political safeguards by holding the president to what he said, politically. Yeah, I am very, very wary about having any statements like that have any, I mean, I suppose I could imagine if I'm truly in equipoise, all right, I'm in, a peppercorn can move me either way. Beyond that, I'm just, I'm very, very wary about taking this statement. I mean, just like the same reason why, look, I actually would take um, authoritative committee reports seriously, but it's the same reason why Scalia is right when it comes to like colloquies on, on when, when, so the floor manager is the person who runs the bill. But there's one executive and 535 members of Congress. No, but there's, there's only one floor manager. That's my point. So the floor manager is running the bill. The floor manager is not mentioned in the Constitution. It's not a relevant figure. I understand. And nothing about President's is. statements is mentioned in the Constitution. He gives a state of the Union. He's required to give a state of the Union. Right. That, that's one of the few duties of, that the Congress has to right. receive the state and, of the and, Union. And the original ones were in writing, but none of them have ever had any legal for it. It's exactly a perfect example. And none has ever, ever had any legal force. One, not, not one has ever been cited in a Supreme Court opinion saying, here's the law, look at the State of the Union. I'm going to check that later. Are we at 1.30? Yeah, any uh, no, 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 parting no, no, words or... <laughs> no, no, this is fine. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I'm not going to check it.